Um, but the title of the sermon is, The God of the Hebrews Has Met With Us. Um, so you're there in Exodus chapter 5. I think it's important for us to know, you know, not just how the Lord appeared to his people in time past, but also how this can apply to us today. So, um, and, and I'm going to go through three different ways that God visits his people um, that we'll see through scripture. Um, so we'll begin there in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 5 verse 1. It says, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the, peop unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. So we see here that Moses has a great, Moses and Aaron have a great fear of God. So they fear that what the Lord might do to them if they don't go and, and give sacrifices they need to. But Pharaoh's like, well, who's the Lord? He doesn't know who he is. So he's got no fear of God. And if you read through the, you know, the chapters in Exodus, talking about uh, how he resists them to leave, then you'll see just how much he hates God. He ends up becoming a reprobate. Um, but we see the Lord visits his people but he wouldn't visit them in the presence of Pharaoh. You know, he makes himself known to them through the men of God, such as Moses and Aaron, but he would not himself appear to them. So it's a blessing to be visited by God. And Abraham was also somebody who had face to face with God. So point one is that some people saw God face to face. I'll get you to turn to Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. So Genesis 18, verse 1, says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plain of Mamre, and he sat in the, t the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if I now have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Just drop down to verse number 8. It says, And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I'll certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. So the Lord had great news here for Abraham. He was not only going to have a son, he was going to have an heir, but he'd also be the father of many nations. You know, so we know that promise was to his seed, you know, which was Christ. Um, and all believers, Old and New Testament, including the children of Israel, you know, would all partake of that seed. Amen. You know, we're all part of that seed by faith in Christ Jesus. Right. And Galatians chapter 3 makes it abundantly clear, and I've preached on it multiple times. You know, Pastor Kevin and others have gone through that as well. You know, it's abundantly clear that that seed is Christ. And it's by faith that you were a child of Abraham. And it is according to the promise. So, but the Lord actually didn't visit him with a prophet, or didn't visit him. He visited him himself, the Lord God, with two angels to come and actually see him face to face. And what a blessing that was. Um, I'll just read to you James 2.23. It says, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and he was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So I'll get you to turn to uh, Ruth chapter 1. But as, the children of the, as children of God, the Lord is going to deal kindly with us. He's going to entreat us. And we should all aim to be called the friend of God. You know, to be walking in his good stead, you know, living those separated, uh, separated lives from the world, you know, talking with him through prayer, you know, and just praising him with your lips every day. Amen. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do because we, we all fail from time to time. You know, every single one of us will fail in that, but... That's our goal regardless, you know, to live that holy separated life for him. So you're in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Marlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. 
And Elimelech Naomi's husband died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Marlon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard the country of Moab, how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, they went on the way to return under the land of Judah. So at this time there was a great famine, and all the nations of the, of the earth were looking to eat. They were struggling with food and you know, crop production and all of that. But you look at verse 6, it says, During this time of famine, the Lord visited his people and gave them bread. So this isn't a physical appearing of the Lord face to face like with Abraham and Moses. But the people there knew, the Israelites knew, people of God knew, the children, uh, that God had visited them. And that's why Ruth and Naomi are looking to go back to that country because that's where the Lord is. And again, that's a lesson for us. We should always be going where the Lord is. You know, the Lord's in church. We should be going to church. You know, the Lord's... Wherever he is, that's where we should be going. Amen. You know, we should be seeking his bread, seeking after him. And, you know, that's a good lesson. I've preached on Ruth before, but that's a great lesson from Ruth, is, is to go where the Lord is, where the God of Israel is, the God of the Hebrews. And, uh, you know, that's another promise as well, that he will visit us in our time of need, just like he did for them. You know, so we seek first that kingdom of God, and we'll have food and raiment, all those necessities. He said, I'll take care of all of that. Um, you can turn to Matthew 6 if you like, but I'll just read to you from that. Um, Matthew 6.31, we're all pretty familiar, but it says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Well, how amazing to have a God who just knows we need these things. That he, he knows that we can't go without food, we can't go without clothing, we can't go without water. You know, so he's going to provide those things for us. In verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So I'll get you to turn to Haggai chapter 1. But, I mean, that's an important promise. If we seek the kingdom of God first, if we look to him first, we go where the Lord is. When he's come to visit us, we need to go where he is. And I'll get to, get to how that works in the New Testament later. But if you want those things to be taken care of, you want food, clothing, all those things, God's provision, he says, just first seek me, just do my works, and, you know, then you're actually going to have that fellowship with God. You'll have that close relationship with him, and he will provide everything for you. So uh, in this chapter in Haggai, the prophet Haggai, he's giving instruction from the Lord to the people of Israel. Um, they forsook building the temple of God, which is the house of God in the Old Testament, but they built their own houses and were dwelling in them. And the Lord was displeased, so he visited his people through the prophet Haggai. So in Haggai chapter 1 verse 3, it says, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, and that's a term you'll find all through the Old Testament as well. Um, it says, It is time for you, O ye, o ye to dwell in your sealed houses, and this, how, is this house lie... Sorry, I'll start again. It is, time, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. So these are people who are putting themselves above God. God's temple was lying in waste, but they built their homes. They're happily living in their homes. They're all warm. They're all clothed. But God says, look, I'm going to take what you have and even take that away from you. 
because you've clothed yourselves. I'll make sure your clothes are all moth-eaten. You know, you've got money, I'll put it in a bag with holes. You're going to lose it all through the holes. You know, you're going to have your crops. I'm going to destroy those too. Uh, he continues in verse 10. It says, Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, upon that which ground bringeth forth, and upon men, upon cattle, upon all the labour of the hands. Again, you just everything they had, God's just like, look, I'll take it all from you. I'll destroy you. I'll take your food. I'll take your raiment. I'll take your clothing. That's why he says in Matthew, you know, if you seek first the kingdom of God, if they'd have built the temple first, God would have given them all those things. But because they sought those things, God took it away from them. You know, that's not how we want to live our life. You know, when God comes to visit us, he will give us provision, but not if we're selfish, not if we're preying upon our own lusts, and not if we're working, you know, to accumulate wealth on this earth. That's just not how God wants it. So, uh, in verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, uh, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. So again, we should fear the prophet of God. We should fear when, when, we, when someone gets up here and speaks the word of God, and it hits you in the heart, and you should fear that. You know, you should receive that and you should, that's something that you should work on because God's speaking to you through that prophet. And that's the way we should always be, is whenever the prophet of God speaks and we hear the words of God, then we should take them to heart. Because you'll see that that actually works out for them in the end. Uh, in verse 13, Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest and the governor of Judah, sorry, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So they got it right. They heard the preaching and they got it right. And God was pleased with them. He said, you know what? I'm with you. You know, I'm, I'm there with you. So for all of us, the Lord can cause us to prosper or to fail. You know, so if you put your own needs before the Lord's needs, then he can cause everything of yours to fail. He can cause you to lose your job. He can cause you to lose your family, to, to lose everything. You know, and we just have to be careful not to fall into that trap. So we see when they, when they rebuilt the temple of the Lord, he was pleased, you know. And he, he says in chapter 2, he actually, the Lord says this to them through the prophet Haggai, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, in the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted, covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. So this even goes back to the promise made to Moses. You know, this is the promise when they came out of the, out of the land of Egypt. God promised he'd be with them, and he dwelt with them, and he was with them, but even here, he's saying, look, just like I promised then, I'm still with you. You know, you've just got to put me first. That's what he wants. You know, and we should also be strong knowing that the Lord's with us. He's our shelter, our strength, our fortress, our, ten, you know, our tower of defense. And even as we've been going through the armor of God, he's our armor. You know, he's our, he's our shield, he's our helmet of salvation, you know, our breastplate of righteousness. You know, God is all those things to us. And safety comes from him. So he can cause, cause us to prosper or fall by his hand. You know, and it says obedience is better than sacrifice. And we see here that the obedience to the words of the Lord, to the prophet of God, you know, that actually led to them being blessed. It wasn't them going doing their own thing. It was them actually being obedient to the Lord that saw their blessing. 
So we'll just go a couple other times that um, the Lord appeared. He appeared when he was with uh, Jacob, where he named him Israel. And that's where they wrestled and he called that place Holy Ground and changed his name to Israel. Um, but the Lord was also in the fiery furnace with the three men of God in Daniel. You know, I'm not going to go through those stories today, but I'll just, uh, I'll just read to you from Genesis 32:30, which is where you'll find the story of, of Jacob and Israel um, wrestling with God. It says, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And also in Daniel chapter 3, where you'll find that story on uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. In verse 25, it says, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. But uh, another one, Joseph, the son of Israel. You know, he, you remember he went into Egypt and he was uh, sold by his brethren. He was there for a long time. Um, but even he believed that the God of the Hebrews would visit them. In Exodus thirteen nineteen, it says, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And we have that same expectation, or at least we should. You know, the Lord is with us. We can know he's never far from us. Um, so I'm going to move on to point Two, I'll get you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. And this is the Lord visiting in the New Testament. So I'll read to you from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 13. Well, you turn to Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. And in Isaiah seven thirteen, it says, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So you're there in Matthew chapter 1. We're just going to read a little passage here about the birth of Christ. It says, Now the birth of Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But when he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is the Holy Ghost. Is, sorry, is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So I'll get you to turn to Luke chapter 7. But Emmanuel is being interpreted as God with us. And that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7 and fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1. And this is a special time where the Lord God of heaven, the creator of all things, you know, he was walking this earth in a physical body, in the flesh. And he visited the people of this earth in the flesh. And he walked it for a little over 33 years. And his purpose here was making himself known and making the Father known and he came to save and die for us to pay for all our sins. So in uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 11, we begin, And it came to pass the day after that he went to a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he had come nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea 
and throughout all the region round about. So these men, these people here, when they saw that man raised from the dead, they recognized God had visited his people. You know, and by many of the miracles that he did, you know, many believed on him. Some thought him to be the Christ, others thought him to be a prophet, but they all believed that God had visited them. You know, no matter how they saw him. And it's the Son of God who reveals the Father to us. You know, it's the Son of God who is God, but it was not the Father who walked among them. He was the Son, you know, and that's very clear. And even back in the Garden of Eden, it was the Son in in the Garden of Eden walking, not the Father. In Genesis 3, 8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Then Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So the Bible makes it clear that no man can see the Father and live, and that no one has seen the Father, but the Son hath declared him. So nobody knows what the Father looks like. Nobody's seen the Father, but the Son, Jesus, has declared him. So we know that even here in Genesis 3, 8, that it was the voice of the Lord, which I'd say is the word of God, that was walking in, you know, walking with Adam and Eve. Um, I'll get you to turn to John chapter 1. I'm going to read to you from, from Luke 10:21. It says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son. And he, to whom the Son will reveal, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples, and he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So how great is it for those men who could hear those things spoken by God, you know, face to face, which many of the prophets even desired to have. You know, they they all died before Jesus came on the scene. So they didn't get to experience what the apostles and disciples got to experience. So he said, blessed are your eyes because you get to see these things. And and your fathers wanted to see those things, but they didn't. And even the transfiguration where it was, you know, uh, only a few of them got to see that. Not all of the disciples or apostles got to see that. But, you know, again, blessed were those who got to actually witness that when they had the baptism, um, where they saw the Holy Ghost come down upon upon him. You know, there were a lot of people there, but still, you know, how many people got to see that? We weren't there. We'll never get to see that. And, you know, we all wonder what it would would be like to have been there. But uh, the Bible actually teaches, even though we might envy, you know, what they actually got to saw, it was great that they got to see that, but we actually have something even better. Um, so we get to that in point three, which is uh, coming up shortly. But in John 1, I had you turn there, verse 10. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Drop down to verse 48. It says, Then Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God the king of Israel. So again, another man who recognized that God had come to visit them. In the flesh, the word manifest in the flesh is what it says in John chapter 1. In John 3.13, it says, that no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So that again, the reason we don't know the Father is because the Son has to declare him. We don't know the Son because the Father declares him. You know, so you've, that's why you don't have the Father without the Son. You know, for those Jews who don't believe on Jesus Christ, well, they don't have the Father. You know, they have a different God. And he makes that perfectly clear. 
But it's just further proof that the Lord God, he was here in the flesh to visit his people. And, you know, his own didn't receive him, but many, including the Gentile nations, they received him. And it was, it was also another important thing is it was God who died on the cross and went to hell. You know, in Psalm 16, 9, it says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Um, this is reiterated in Acts chapter 2. In, in Acts 2, 23, it says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He's talking about Jesus Christ. It says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So I get on to point three now. After Christ ascended back to heaven, and he was loosed from those pains of death, and he escaped, you know, hell, uh, overcame hell and death, and has the keys of hell and death, as it teaches later on. But after that, has anything changed? You know, does the Lord still visit us? And, well, he promised he'd never leave or forsake us. So we can know for certain that while he's not walking in the flesh with us, that he did not leave us alone. So how does that work? Well, he says he left us the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. And these are several aspects of the Comforter. Um, I'll get you turned to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. But I'll read to you from John 14, verse 15. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now again, we know eternal life is eternal. That's the promise we're hanging our hat on. Well, if he says that he'll be with you forever, he'll abide with you forever, then we can trust in that just as much. That comforter is always going to be with us. In Ephesians 1 verse 11, it talks about the comforter. It says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of his glory. So that comforter, the Holy Spirit of promise, he's with us until we're redeemed at Christ's return. You know, that's why he said he'll, he'll abide with you forever. And... I've just got a little story here. When I, one time when I was out soul winning, I, uh, I came across this elderly woman. She was a Baptist pastor's wife. And she's probably, I'd say, in her 70s, maybe late 70s, 80s. But she had either Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that. And her brain was completely gone. She couldn't tell me what day of the week it was, couldn't tell me the name of a church. She couldn't tell me anything. But when I questioned her on whether she knew she was going to heaven, she knew you know, the Holy Spirit was still with her, still abode with her. Yep. Even though her mind had gone, the Spirit was still there. Amen. And so her testimony was the witness of Jesus Christ by faith alone. Once saved, always saved. And it, it was just a blessing to hear that from her, to know that I couldn't communicate with her in any other way, but my spirit could communicate with her spirit, to know she was a sister in Christ. And that's why I believe that any, someone who's believed, who's a son of God, they've received that Holy Ghost that Holy Spirit of promise, the comforter, that person is going to be consistent with their testimony of Christ. You know, they're not going to change a few years later suddenly to believing something else. You know, because the Spirit of God will always be with you. He'll always abide with you. And he'll always testify of Christ. So somebody who changes their testimony, it just shows they weren't of Christ. They weren't of us. You know. In John 14, verse 17... It says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. 
So the world can't receive the comforter. You know, they are going to be left comfortless unless they believe on Christ. But that's, that's a promise that we will not be left without comfort and joy. You know, we're going to have the joy of the Holy Ghost, the joy of our salvation. I'll continue in John 14, verse 18. It says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, yet sh- ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Now what a promise from Christ. You know, he promises that he'll dwell in us, and we dwell in him through that Spirit of God. But how much more amazing is this than even to have a face-to-face with God, to actually be that close that you're dwelt, you know, the Lord dwells in you. You know, God dwells in you and you in him. And it says if we keep, if we keep his commandments, the Lord will manifest himself to us and walk with us. Now, commandments have nothing to do with salvation, but he'll manifest himself. That means that he'll, he'll actually walk with you, commune with you. You'll have a good relationship with him if we keep his commandments, if we walk uprightly. You know, and that's our daily goal, is to walk in the Spirit and to commune with God, because that's what He desires. In verse 21, John 14, it says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Verse 25, same chapter. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Lord, through the Comforter, he teach us all of the Word of God. You know, in order for us to be keepers and doers of the Word, then he must have given us his Word. You know, and that's one of the most important roles of the Comforter for us, is to teach us all things that the Lord has commanded us through his Word. That's the Holy Scripture, and that's the King James Bible for those of us who speak English. In uh, verse 27 of John chapter 14, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. So I recommend reading John chapter 15 as well for yourself. But it shows that we can do nothing without Christ. You know, it says if we do not abide in him, we're not going to produce fruit. And that's the most important thing that a Christian can do is produce more fruit. In John 15, 7 it reads, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. We see the Lord manifesting himself unto us. You know, your prayers being answered, you know, being his disciples, producing fruit, all of this is contingent on being faithful to him and to his commandments. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's why we should walk in the spirit and abide with him and he will abide in us. We'll get you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. So Matthew 18, 18. Matthew 18, 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So where two or three are gathered, he said, there am I in the midst of them. In church, God's amongst us. You know, that's important to understand. That's why we should come to church and be with the brethren. Because the Lord actually visits his people. You know, he visits us here with his presence, but also through his word. And we, also when we make judgments, it says the God of the Hebrews is with us. You know, it says that heaven will recognize the judgments of the church. And that's what the context of this is. I hate when people take this, ch- this portion of scripture out of context. This is not justifying some kind of home group or some kind of, you know, home church, whatever you want to call it. 
You know, this is about the church of God. The church of God is established with a pastor and with, with congregation. It's a congregation of believers, and that's what God respects. God respects their judgment. And uh, it even says that heaven will recognize the judgment of the church. And that's important. That's why it's important for us to be in church. Because we can make those judgments that God actually commands us to make. But also, it's not something I went over, but when Moses met face to face with God, you, you, most of you would probably know that his face actually shone with a very bright light. He had to wear a veil over his face because they couldn't even look upon him. Um, I'll get you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But his face shone, Moses' face shone when, the, when, when he met the God of the Hebrews. And it explains here in 2 Corinthians that our faith shines also with the light of God. So the next time the Lord visits the earth, he's coming with the sword and judgment. We know that from Revelation. But it can still be said today that the God of the Hebrews has met with us because we are the light to our world. You know, and our face shines like the face of Moses did. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But withal, with open face, bolt beholding even as in glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5, it says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who, commend, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So that's the gospel. You know, that light of the knowledge of the glory of God which shone on Moses' face, that now shines in our hearts. You know, that's the gospel and that's why he's given it to us in earthen vessels where his workers here on the earth says we're actually laboring together with him, you know, to evangelize this world. And that's our purpose here. In James 1.22, it says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So that shows the two contrasting ways to walk in this world. There are those who hear the word and don't do it. They don't keep the commands of God. They're like the man who's looking in the glass, looking in the mirror at himself, but he forgets what manner of man he was. But he's beholding his own image, he's not beholding the image of Christ. Where it says here in 2 Corinthians that we should be beholding the image of Christ. When we look in the mirror, we should see Christ. When other people look at our face, they should see the light of God shining through it. And that's how we're supposed to walk on this earth. But that person who looks in the, in, the, in the glass and sees himself, that man's unprofitable. God can't use that man. It says, but the man who hears the word of God and does it is like the man who beholds the glass and he sees the image of the Lord. You know, we should walk as that light and shine that light of Christ to this world. And our church at least does that. You know, we have a great soul winning program. We have a lot of men who go out Amen. and women as well and children. You go out soul winning, and that's the best thing we can do. That's how we can have that light of Christ. Yeah. And yeah, our faith should shine just as Moses did. So in John 14, 22, it says, Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Because you remember that he wouldn't manifest himself to Pharaoh. He wouldn't manifest himself to people who hate God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and he will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. So we're not the son of God to visit the people on, this, on the earth in the flesh. You know, Jesus is the son of God, 
and he did that 2,000 years ago. But we that are of faith in him, we are the sons of God. And God visits them through us as we preach the word to him, as we preach it to each other. You know, this is how the Lord actually walks amongst us. And this is why our name, our reputation, our, our conversation in the world should also reflect Christ. You know, our image should always reflect Christ. So maybe people then will ask, what is the hope of your salvation? You know, why are you so joyful? Why do you not care about what happens to this world? You know, we should have an answer to that hope. And our answer, of course, should always be pointing to Christ. But when they look at us, they should see Christ. You know, they, when they look at us, they should be able to say, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. You know, so we're, we should live our life with that in mind and let Christ shine through us. So I'll just go through those, those three ways that God visits his people. The first way was face to face. People like Moses, people like Abraham, people like Adam, uh, and even, even uh, Israel. Um, the second point is through prophets and his word. So we, he's left us with his word. We have his word here. And even the Old Testament, even when there was a gap between Malachi and Matthew of a few hundred years, I think about 400 years or something, that they still had the word. They still had the law and the prophets. Amen. So God did not leave them or forsake them. He, he left them with the word and said, just keep doing this until I come. And then the third point is through us. He visits the world through us. And he visits us also with our brethren. That's how iron sharpeneth iron. And, you know, we can um, fellowship together and know that the Lord is with us. He's in the, in the midst of us. So I'll just get uh, Pastor to come up and pray.